If you are in this book, in this class, taking using this book, I'm going to talk about the key ideas in the first part of chapter five on magnetostatics. So there's, there's some stuff in there, especially when you get to vector potential, it's gonna require a little bit more work, but let's just go over the key ideas and then we can do some problems from that. Okay, so number one is, it starts off, I'm gonna do the same order that the book does. Number one is the Lorentz force. So the Lorentz force says, suppose that I have a charge right here and it's moving with a velocity V well, that charge is going to experience a magnetic force uh, that looks like this, B Q V cross B. Now, it could also experience an electric force. So we usually like to combine those two together with the Lorentz force, F is Q times the electric field plus Q times V cross B. That's the force on a charged particle. Now, in, in class, we had the discussion about, well, what if I have a charge right there and a charge right there and that one's moving and that one's not, what happens? You know, we can get into complicated situations like this, but at the classical level, at the classical level, this says that, well, this charge uh, would make a magnetic field, we'll get into that a little bit, that would make an electric field, that would make an electric field. So because that one makes a magnetic field, but that one's not moving, it does not experience a magnetic force because this one doesn't make a magnetic field because it's not moving, that one doesn't experience magnetic force. So instead, they would just have uh, an electric force pushing them apart, okay? So you have to make a magnetic field and be in the presence, you have to be in the presence of a magnetic field to experience a force and to be moving. Now, here's the other part is that we have, uh, if that's the velocity, uh, let's say that I have the magnetic field is into the board, so that's my B. Uh, so just a note, we put this is a vector in, this is a vector out of the page or the board. And that's just a way to keep track of three-dimensional vectors. Everything has to be 3D here, uh, and you'll see why. So to calculate the force, uh, let's, just, let's just put this in normal terms. So here I have X, Y, so in this case, I'm gonna say V, is going to be equal to vx, 0, 0, it's in the x direction. b is in the negative z direction, so I'm going to say 0, 0, negative b, z. So let's calculate the cross part of v cross b. If you remember, v cross b is the determinant of the matrix x hat, y hat, z hat. Now I'm going to put my components of v, in this case that's going to be vx, 0, 0. Then I'm going to put my components of B. 0, 0, negative B, Z. So if I take this cross product, I'm going to expand about this row, and I get 0 times B, Z minus 0 times 0. For the Y direction, remember there's a negative 1 power there, so I'm actually going to go backwards. I have 0 times 0 minus VX times negative B, Z. So I'm going to get VX B, Z. And then in the Z direction, I get 0, 0. So this says this would be a force in the Y direction this way. This is where our right-hand rule comes into play. So remember, if I have two vectors, A and B, and C is A cross B, the vector C has to be perpendicular to A, and it has to be perpendicular to, to B. There's only two vectors in three-dimensional space that are perpendicular to both. One of them, let me get a little marker here, is this vector coming out of the board, and the other one is going into the board. We can use our right hand to determine which one. If you take your fingers of your right hand and let them curl through A and then B, your thumb will point in the direction. So in this case, that would be the direction of C. So if we use that up here, I have QV. It's important to group Q and V together because the charge matters. So QV is that way, B is that way. So I want to do QV cross B. So my fingers are going to go this way and that's my force. That's what we got. Okay. Okay, so that is the Lorentz force. There's a bunch of cool applications with the Lorentz force, but I'm just getting the basics here, just the basics.
Um, okay, the next thing, there, there's a section in there about how magnetic fields don't do work, and that's because the displacement is perpendicular to the magnetic field, um, so the magnetic field force can't do work, which is only partially true. It's true in the classical sense. Um, if you have a, a, a ring of, char of current, you can, you can have work done on that um, by two rings. And, elect and if you include electron spin, you can do work. Okay, but it's not a big deal. Not a big deal. Here, it's a big deal. It's not a big deal here. Okay, the next thing we have is, oh, oh what if I have a wire? What if I have a wire in a magnetic field, I? And there's some magnetic field all over the place. Well, it turns out that if you break a little piece of that wire uh, into a length dl with a with a vector dl, then I can treat I dl just like it's just like QV. It's the same units. I is a flow of charge. It's the same thing. So I can find the force on that little b piece. I could say df is uh, I dl cross b, just like qv cross b. And then if I want to find the total force, I just have to integrate over the whole thing, and it'd be I dl cross b. So this is actually complicated. Uh, you can imagine if you had some curved wire like this, you know, how would you find the total force on that? Also, the magnetic field can change, so it's not trivial. But in general, when you see qv, you can replace that with IDL. Okay. Next on the list is, oh, uh, surface charge density, surface current density, and current density. Yeah. So we define this, K, as the surface current density. It's the surface charge density, sigma, which we saw before, multiplied by the velocity of the charges. And then we have the current density, which is the charge density times the velocity. This is the one that we're gonna see a lot. Now, it turns out that, you know, imagine that I have a wire, and I have charges moving like that. So the current density, J, is really just the total current divided by the area. It's the charge, the current per unit area, right, that crosses through this region right there. What if I have one of the, the relationships that come up is the relationship between if I know this then I know that uh, the divergence of the current density is negative the rate of change of the charge density. So what this says is that if you have a current density like this and it's constant then there's no charge buildup. There's no change in charge density. However, if I have something like this, a current density that looks like this, well, I'm gonna have, to, if the current's going out that way, I'm gonna have to lose charge over here, so I'd have a negative rate of change of charge density. That's what that says. Now we get to the law of BO and Savar. This is very important. So what if I have a moving charge V, Q, I can find the magnetic field everywhere using this. I can say B is mu naught over 4 pi. Mu naught is the magnetic constant, um, just like we had epsilon naught as the electric constant. This is actually the permittivity, permeability of free space. Uh, Q, V cross R hat over the magnitude of R squared. So here R is the vector from the charge to where you want to find that uh, magnetic field right there. Because we're dealing with the cross product, okay, so here's QV, here's R, R hat is that way too, so if I look at the cross product, it's, it's going to give me a magnetic field going into the board. Up here, it's going to be a magnetic field going out of the board. So if you draw the charge coming out of so let's say there's your charge and it's coming out of the board, we're going to get these circular patterns for the magnetic field. Right-hand rule. So this is another right-hand rule shortcut. If you put your thumb in the direction of the current or positive charge, your, your fingers curl in the direction of the magnetic field. So this would be this way, this way, this way, 
this way, this way, this way, this way. And then uh, over here, as you get further away, it gets smaller because you have a greater R value. But it's still like that. And that's due to a single charge, moving charge. Okay, that, that picture of the shape of the magnetic field is important to picture in your mind. And it's kind of hard because it's a 3D picture. Okay. What if I have uh, a wire and I want to find the current? Well, remember, we can replace QV with IDL, but that means that I'm going to have to integrate over the length of the wire. So the magnetic field due to a wire is going to be mu naught over 4 pi, uh, the integral of IDL cross R hat over the magnitude of R squared. You, you could also write this as, in both of these, you could write this as mu naught over 4 pi Q V cross R over the magnitude of R cubed, because remember R hat is R over the magnitude of R. Again, I'm just giving you a review here. I'm not, I'm not going over everything. Okay. Now we have uh, uh, Ampere's law. This is, this is kind of important. Uh, so just like we had Gauss's law that was useful to determine the, the magnitude of the electric field if we know something about the symmetry, we have the same thing for Ampere's law. This says that the integral around a closed path of B dot DL is equal to mu naught I N. So imagine that I have, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm trying to pick a, a shape. So suppose I have some current passing through this region of space and I integrate B dot DL around that loop, it should be mu naught times that current right there. And it's always true, but it's useful if you have symmetry. And we'll do a problem like that. Don't worry about it. We will indeed do a problem. Uh, but that's Ampere's law. Now, remember, if you don't remember, you can always look in the book, in the front, front important stuff. And I'm looking at uh, the curl theorem or Stokes theorem. This says that the integral of del cross A dot n hat dA is equal to uh, the path integral of A dot dl around a closed path. Well, look at this. We have that. So we should get um, this whole thing says that del cross b dot n hat dA is equal to this. But this is equal to that, which is mu naught i n. So imagine that I have some region and I have a current density j. How do I find the current density, the total current? I would be the integral over the, the area of j dot n hat dA. So that means that this times mu naught, that has to be equal to that times mu naught. So we get the differential form of Ampere's law it says the curl of B is mu naught j just like we had the differential form of Gauss's law. Now, we do have one more uh, thing, and it's this, del dot b. The Gauss's law for magnetic fields is zero. So this just says, remember, we had del dot e was rho over epsilon naught. That said, that was Gauss's law, and that's the electric charge density. We have a zero magnetic charge density because we don't have magnetic charges. So there's no magnetic monopoles, so the divergence of the magnetic field is zero. Okay, introduction problems to come. That was just the intro. And there's another half on vector potential, but we have a lot of stuff to do here, so I just thought we'd stop. Playlist for this whole thing's down below. I thought you had knew that already. <laughs>